In January of 1994, less than four years into this series lifespan, Intelligent Systems released what would go on to become the highest selling game in the entire franchise for the next 16 years running, Fire Emblem Mystery of the Emblem. Though it contained a shortened remake of the original story of Marth, the real focus was its brand new sequel campaign, which followed Marth again on an all new quest to save the world. The impact that its release had on this series cannot be overstated. Its high sales and glowing reception in Japan transformed Fire Emblem from a noteworthy but still developing young series into an attention-grabbing mega-hit. Though the original two Famicom entries had their own fans, it was this moment when the Fire Emblem series developed into a full-blown franchise, one whose very long history of ups and downs have finally led us here. Fire Emblem 12, New Mystery of the Emblem, Heroes of Light and Shadow, on top of being a mouthful of a title, would eventually prove to be just as pivotal for the series' development. Taking the story of Book 2 of the Super Famicom original, New Mystery not only expanded upon the story with new plot lines, characters, and maps, but it also added a host of new features and systems that, like its predecessor on the DS, made it less of a remake and more a completely new entry that just happened to share its maps with an older game. In many ways, this entry can be said to have been the herald for the direction that Fire Emblem would begin going in throughout the coming years. And it's this design direction which the series has continued to this very day. As I always do, I worked my way through this entry twice, and I think the simplest way that I can begin to unpack my feelings about it is to just say, Fire Emblem 12 was certainly not what I was expecting it to be. Today, on the Fire Emblem Retrospective, we are going to be trying to sort out the fascinations and frustrations of this very perplexing entry. We will be covering its development history, in particular the path to one of the most critical design decisions ever in this franchise's history that finally became a reality here. After that, we'll be running down the plot, and then analyzing both it and the gameplay's developments, deviations, and degenerations. All right, let's get started. Though the formation of New Mystery of the Emblem began as expected, starting up during the production of the prior game, by the end of its unexpectedly elongated development cycle, both this game and the series as a whole would be irrevocably changed. The difference between what this meant for the legacy of Mystery of the Emblem as compared to New Mystery of the Emblem would go on to be as contrasting as night and day. The period of time between the releases of Fire Emblems 9 to 12 was without a doubt the darkest age of the franchise. At this point, Intelligent Systems had been trying to find their feet for almost five years straight, consistently failing to find the same success of the Game Boy Advance era Fire Emblems. After the last game, Shadow Dragon failed to make significant sales in the West, but still sold a decent amount of copies in Japan, it was decided to bring the series back to only releasing in its home country, making this next game the first since The Binding Blade that would not be getting a Western release. Originally, New Mystery was meant to debut much closer to Shadow Dragon's 2008 release date, but the staff soon found that the same design ideas used there were not going to fit this particular project. As more and more ideas were pooled and implemented, one of the most contentious issues for the team since the days of Genealogy of the Holy War reared its ugly head. This issue was the possible inclusion of a new mode which would remove the long-running system of permadeath from the game experience. When asked about what makes Fire Emblem as a series unique, one of the most common answers that many at Intelligent Systems give is the fact that their game contains permadeath. It's often described as the key element of tension that makes the joy of success feel even more rewarding and is a major element of what they see as the fun of Fire Emblem. 
Removing permadeath, or at the very least allowing some players to remove it if they wished, was not going to be an easy option for the team to take. However, where this series was financially during the development of Fire Emblem 4 compared to where it was right now were totally different. It was actually Nintendo who started to suggest that the team seriously consider allowing players to make this choice. Discussions with Nintendo made them keenly aware that the permadeath system was not only seen as harsh from non-fans, but it was actually turning away people who would have otherwise tried the games. It was this statement that finally made the idea stick. For the developers, the distinction between players that will constantly reset so that they can go for a perfect run, and those who just play on even if they lose a unit, were very apparent. However, they had never before considered that new players simply wouldn't have these instincts, or realize that they have the choice to reset or not. From that perspective, they would instead find the game to just be overly punishing without any acceptable recourse. Finally, they began to wonder if some kind of accommodation could be found. In August of 2008, very early into New Mystery's development period, in an interview performed by Satoru Iwata, former CEO of Nintendo Japan, the developers discussed at length the critical link between Fire Emblem and the concept of permadeath, breaking down the reasons why, after a decade and a half, that this aspect would finally be made into an option for players to choose for themselves. Although the staff was wary of such a direction, a prototype featuring these changes was made and playtested, and the results of this experiment were very clear. This new mode, which allowed Permadeath to simply exit the entire experience, was immediately lauded by testers, which was the result that cemented its oncoming inclusion. After years of the topic being shelved, one of the most pivotal changes in the entire series had just been set into motion. Since this mode was not only built for beginners, but just for anyone who wanted to play the games comfortably and without the tension of the older style of play, it was not named Easy, but instead a Casual mode. The traditional format was named Classic in order to reference how it was to be viewed as the continuation of the gameplay of old. Like Shadow Dragon, New Mystery of the Emblem was not simply a remake, but rather a whole new Fire Emblem adding in a brand new prologue, side story missions, new characters, and bringing back a support system and info conversation system in the style of Path of Radiance. As a bonus, many new extras were also included, such as the maps that had previously only been seen in Fire Emblem BS, one of the few games that were only available on the limited access Satellaview add-on for the Super Famicom in Japan. Just a note here, I may look at Fire Emblem BS and its remade content from this game in the future as a bonus video for the series, but for the rest of this video, I am just going to be focusing on New Mystery of the Emblem's main content. Speaking of that new content, the biggest of all the additions can actually be seen right on the front of the game's box, and that is Chris, the generic name for New Mystery's customizable My Unit character. The only other time the series had done anything like this before was in the Blazing Blades Tactician. But unlike them, Chris would be a fighting unit with a substantial place in this plot. After an unusually bumpy and contentious development period, the 12th main entry of this series finally released only in Japan on July 15th, 2010. Despite all this work to open up the gameplay to everybody, the sales of this entry started out very disappointing selling 75% fewer copies during its debut week than Shadow Dragon. Over time, Fire Emblem 12 did manage to climb to almost the same Japanese sales numbers as Shadow Dragon, but these results still meant that for the fourth time in a row, this series had failed to achieve its desired sales numbers. Nintendo now saw Fire Emblem as a franchise on the verge of collapse. In the wake of yet another inadequate sales report, the Fire Emblem team would soon be given an ultimatum. If the next game could not sell more than 250,000 copies, breaking the franchise out of the pattern which it had been given many chances to fix, then that game would be the series' last. Though the original Mystery of the Emblem had been the game that put Fire Emblem on the map, ironically, New Mystery of the Emblem was the one that put it on its deathbed. Of course we know by the fact that the series is still around that this wasn't what happened, but the tale of one of the most remarkable turnarounds in gaming is going to be a story for next time. For now, we must move on and start diving into the story of this entry. 
As always, if you already know the story of this version, then I'm going to leave a timecode that will take you right to the beginning of my story analysis section. If you want to avoid all spoilers and just get right to the gameplay analysis, you should use the timecode at the bottom. Okay everyone, let's get going in 3, 2, 1. At last, the conquest of evil had been stopped, and the continent of Arcanea was finally at peace. After Prince Marth had led the revolutionary army and struck down the dragon Medius with his family's divine blade, he had settled back down to rule his kingdom of Altea with the beautiful Princess Sita at his side. Though it was ravaged by the war, the peaceful days he spent rebuilding his kingdom were a treasure that he had fought very hard for. But this return to tranquility was certainly not the case for many of the other devastated nations. In the aftermath of the war, a power vacuum existed in the great nation of Arcanea, the kingdom to whom the six other nations were all suzerain to. Prince Hardin of Aurelis, a mighty cavalry commander in his own right and close friend of Marth, was selected to wed Arcanea's Princess Nina, and soon after he was crowned the new king of Arcanea. After beginning his reign as a benevolent and beloved ruler, quite suddenly Hardin seemed to change. He declared himself the emperor of the land, forming the new Arcanean Empire. Meanwhile, back in Altea, a new generation of knights were in training. Among them was the young warrior Chris, who, shortly into his training, crashed into fellow trainee Katarina, as well as the other young fighters who formed the 7th platoon. With their training overseen by Jagan and the other loyal knights of Altea, these days were incredibly challenging, but also very fruitful. In time, all of them stood before Marth, ready to receive their knighthood. Unfortunately, their ceremony was crashed by a sudden incursion of fighters, assassins hired to take out Prince Marth, with the girl Katarina being the one who let them in, despite the bonds that she had made with her fellow trainees. With reluctance, Katarina ultimately went forward with her mission, but Chris and the new Knights of Altea managed to beat back her attack, causing the assassins to flee. It had been one year since the destruction of Medius. While Marth and his new royal guard Chris were focused on safeguarding their own nation, a messenger from Emperor Hardin arrived, bringing with them an ominous request. In the west, the nation of Groost had rebelled, and Marth was called on to restore the Emperor's control there. Both out of an allegiance to Arcanea, as well as a respect for his friend, the prince ultimately set out on this mission. Once arriving in Groost, he soon noticed that nothing seemed to be right. The man keeping the Emperor at bay was none other than Lorenz, the noble Groostian general who had sided with Marth in the past. The Arcanean commander instructing Marth was General Lang, a thoroughly despicable man who seemed intent on crushing and punishing Groost for their betrayal vowing to not only kill Lorenz, but also execute the Grustian royal children as punishment. Despite not knowing how to process this despicable order, Marth managed to speak with Lorenz, who unfortunately had taken a mortal wound shortly before the prince's arrival. Though Marth promised to safeguard the children in his absence, Lang brusquely took them away, ignoring Marth's pleas to stop. He then informed them of their next mission which was to travel to Macedon and free Princess Minerva, who had also had a revolution spring up in her land, one that had resulted in her capture and imprisonment. After agreeing even more reluctantly this time, the group departed, along the way running into their ally Lind, who came bearing a gift from the Empress Nina, the Fire Emblem. This item was a symbol of Arcanean support, one that was only meant to be bestowed to a hero who was needed to save the world. Although he was unsure why she was giving him this, since he could not see now how the world was once again in utter peril, he accepted it nonetheless. After arriving at Minerva's location, Marth's group began to move in, but soon were shocked when her brother, Prince Mikolas, who had been thought dead since the last war, reappeared and rescued her himself. Leaving Marth to pacify the rest of the foes, he flew off, and once again when the deed was done, General Lang appeared with a new despicable mission. This time, however, Marth and his knights could no longer bear to follow his orders. Not caring for the consequences, Marth, Jagan, and Chris all confronted him, with the old knight Jagan even going so far as to challenge him to a duel to the death. 
a threat which Lang responded to by immediately fleeing. With an intent to confront Hardin about the recent atrocities inflicted on his people by the likes of Lang, before setting out for their next destination, in the skies above, a single Pegasus rider appeared, none other than Princess Sita, who brought with her extremely dire news. While Marth and his forces had been away, the Arcanaean Empire launched a sudden invasion of their homeland, and had quickly seized complete control over it. Now, without a doubt, Emperor Hardin had set himself towards destroying Marth and his allies, and once again, the prince commanded nothing more than a small rebellious force, facing up against a continent-spanning empire. It was this empire that was now actively hunting him this very moment. After deciding that their best bet was to flee to Cadain, Marth's group first stopped at Grust, and finally settled the score with General Lang, eventually finding the Bishop Wendell along the way. Wendell was the former ruler of the independent nation of Cadain, and was currently journeying on a quest that had been given to him by the great sage Goto another one of their most critical allies from the last war. After Goto had made a powerful magic for Marth, which was what had allowed him to defeat the dark magician Garnif, one of the relics used in the process, the Star Sphere, had shattered into multiple pieces. Marth had already come across some of these pieces on his travels, and now he agreed to assist Wendell in finding the rest. From there, Marth turned north, all the while pursued more and more by the Arcanaean forces. Even Emperor Hardin himself appeared, revealing that the man that Marth had known before had utterly changed into something else, all the while exuding an evil energy that made him impervious to any attack. Thanks to a brave standoff by Chris and the rest of the Prince's Guard, the group were able to escape by sea and arrive in Cadain. And during their travels to the city, they surprisingly found Princess Minerva safe and sound in a village nearby. After learning that she had been left there by her brother intentionally so that she could join up with Marth, with his new powerful ally, the group finally arrived in the capital, where Wendell quickly settled a deadly dispute that had arisen between two of his pupils. Although they were safe for now from Hardin, they knew that it was only a matter of time before he would catch up with them, and now they had nowhere left to run. Once again, their only hope for salvation sought them out from afar as the great sage Goto psychically contacted the group, revealing that the current crisis was caused by the lingering spirit of Garnif, who had remained in this world thanks to the power of the Dark Sphere, the same object which had now made its way into Hardin's hands, corrupting him just as he was at his most vulnerable state. Though Hardin deeply loved his new wife Nina, sadly, she was unable to return his feelings, due to her unbreakable feelings for another the great general of Grust, Camus, the same man whom Marth had been forced to slay towards the end of the last war. The Dark Sphere given to Hardin quickly preyed on his negative emotions, completely swallowing his soul while magnifying all of his worst traits to an extreme level, such as his hidden jealousy of Marth. The only way for the prince to triumph over the emperor and his new powers was for Marth to seek out Goto personally and receive the Light Sphere, the only item which could nullify the dark energy surrounding Hardin and allow someone to defeat him. Getting to Goto's location, however, would not be easy. To do so, Marth would have to travel a path that only one other human had ever survived through, that person being the ancestor of Marth who had defeated Medius over a century before. This trail into the harsh wilderness had been named for him, Henri's Way. After suffering through a sweltering desert, volcanic hellscape, and a bitterly frozen plain, Marth finally stood before the Great Sage, ready to receive his salvation. In return for his bravery, the sage not only presented him with the Light Sphere, but also placed the sleeping Manakeet Princess Tiki, whom Goto had sealed away again for her own safety, into Marth's care. On top of this, he also united the Star Shards into the full Star Sphere again, and finally explained that these powerful orbs were all part of a set of five, all of which were originally meant to go onto the Fire Emblem which Marth now held. With all five orbs present, the Fire Emblem would be complete, giving it the power to bind and banish the dark powers of Garnif and the evil dragons he allied himself with. Understanding now the exact path before them to save the continent and his corrupted friend, Marth was teleported back to his homeland, 
and, just as he had done over a year ago, he fought fiercely to liberate Altea, luckily retrieving the Geosphere, another one of the five orbs, along the way. After finally throwing the invaders out of his own land, the group had little time to celebrate, as yet again a group of assassins attacked them, led by Katarina. After multiple encounters with her all this time, with each one causing her to question her own motivations more and more, Katarina finally succumbed to her true feelings, and abandoned her mission and her former group. It was Chris who was the one who finally convinced her to leave her life behind, and despite everything that she had done in the past, Prince Marth and the others, due to their intense trust in the Royal Guardsman, who had by now proved himself many times over, welcomed the girl to their side. With the crisis and Altea finished, it was finally time to seek out Hardin in his own land, and to end this war with one fell swoop. Doing so meant fighting their way through the remaining nations still under the Empire's control, something which by now had been made easier due to the waves of resistances which kept popping up across the continent. It was this that allowed Marth to easily pass through the neighboring nation of Gra, and to now seek out the shortest possible path to the Arcanan capital. During this journey, the king of Aurelis and Hardin's older brother met with Marth, saying that even he realized that his brother had to be stopped. Though the king could not bring himself to fully side with them, he did pledge his nation's neutrality, and presented Marth with the fourth of the missing orbs, the Life Sphere. At last, the prince and his liberating army arrived directly at the Empire's stronghold, finding that it too had been weakened by a recent rebellion, as even the Arcanaean citizens desperately tried to free themselves from the corrupted Hardin's cruel rule. Marth's group cornered the Emperor, and through the power of the Light Sphere countering the Dark, they were finally able to defeat him with one fell swoop. For a short moment before his death, Hardin reverted back to the noble and loyal friend that Marth had once known. He admitted that, in his corrupted state, he had given his queen Nina over to Garneth, who had been recently seeking out pure maidens for use in a dark ritual. After asking for both Marth and his beloved Nina to forgive him, Hardin finally passed away, leaving the Dark Sphere behind him. At last, all five orbs and the Fire Emblem had been gathered, and with a sudden resonating flash, they bound themselves together, forming the legendary Binding Shield. While Marth and his company mourned Hardin, they were suddenly approached by the four missing maidens, including Nina, Minerva's sister Maria, the gentle cleric Elena, and Marth's own sister, Princess Elise. Though they spoke as though they wished to congratulate their savior, the Binding Shield suddenly reacted to their presence, releasing a magic wave that struck the four women, revealing them to be nothing more than illusions conjured by Garneth. After seeing through Garneth's trickery, the sage Goto arrived to congratulate Marth on his victory, who then suddenly put together why the Dark Magician had replaced the four girls. The ritual he was preparing would be one that would revive Medius again in a new, more terrible form. With no time to lose, the heroes rushed to the only location this could be done, the Dragon's Altar, the same place where the great dragon Naga, Tiki's mother, had sealed the Dark Dragon tribe away millennia ago. Just outside the altar, the group found a mortally wounded Prince Mikolas, who quickly gave them the Tome Starlight that he had managed to retrieve, asking them to take their revenge against Garnif on his behalf. Despite the twisted and wicked actions he had done in the past, Macedon's prince's last actions were certainly noble, for he had just made it possible for Marth to stand a chance in this fight. Before long, the prince had ascended the dragon's altar and struck down the spirit of Garnif although they were too late to stop the ritual. Medius had already been reborn as a true Shadow Dragon, but with both the Binding Shield and the Falchion in hand, this was the perfect chance to stop him. As the waves and waves of Medius's dragon army crashed against them, the united heroes of Arcanea kept battling, and soon, one by one, each of the corrupted maidens who were set to guarding Medius were restored by their loved ones. With the last scent of the dragon's corruption expunged, Marth challenged Medius, once again besting him in combat. With the dragon's downfall, the crisis which had plagued the world was finally over. Though the cost of this war had been high, at last the people of Arcanea, united under the righteous banner of Marth the Hero King, could rest. 
though the tales of his royal guard, often called Altea's finest knight, would eventually be forgotten. The name of Marth would not, even thousands of years past his time. While the other heroes of the land finally returned to their lives, for the rest of Marth's days spent alongside his beautiful queen and his many loyal friends, the hero would lead the United Kingdom of Arcanea into a safe and secure golden age. I have to admit that I have a bit of a soft spot for the story of the original Mystery of the Emblem. From the perspective that I took going through these games, and that's of a person who was blind to the rest of the series and intentionally went through them in release order, the steps that the third game took to modernize its presentation were actually very exciting for me. I remember thinking at the time, wow, a map! They used a map! And I can actually tell what's going on and where I'm supposed to be! That was the first time I felt that I was getting a readable glimpse into the world of Arcanea. But the story that followed was never one of the series' best. Marth's follow-up tale wasn't planned out during the original game. Rather, it was a new direction after the team finished Fire Emblem Gaiden. This results in this story's major plot drivers having absolutely no setup in the previous game, which misses out on a lot of the potential for sequels. Looking back on my time with Fire Emblems 9 and 10, many of my favorite plot points in the latter came from things that were set up in the prior game and satisfyingly paid off. Had Radiant Dawn been completely without these, then I imagine that I would have been harder on the plot than I already was. Before embarking on the DS Fire Emblems, I of course knew ahead of time that the two games had been created one after the other, meaning that this time around the developers would have the chance to tie them in better with each other. They could just add a line for Goto about the Star Orb being shattered, or maybe some kind of hint that Garnef's spirit had managed to linger on after his death, something which could have also happened after the credits. This, unfortunately, never materialized in Shadow Dragon. And apart from one conversation with Hardin that maybe sets up how he will have a future jealousy of Marth, a lot of this potential, which had the capability of enriching this next story just a little bit more, was lost. Shadow Dragon was a game that was utterly devoted to maintaining the same feeling as the original. Despite how much of a renewal it was meant to be, in terms of its story, it was so dedicated to this that it would actually pass up on such a golden opportunity like this one. As I said in the last video, that is a stance that I can at least respect. And as I saw these chances being passed up, I imagined to myself that New Mystery style would also be carrying on this legacy, giving a faithful but tweaked re-adaptation of the original Super Famicom game's sequel story. Well, I was really wrong about that. While Shadow Dragon was stubbornly dedicated to preserving the past, New Mystery of the Emblem couldn't be more different. This time, the story of the original game has been bent, twisted, and sometimes broken, all to make room for the developer's new focus on a near-obsessive level of reverence for the introduction of its new original content. And by this new original content, I mean almost entirely the character Chris. Going just from my synopsis, where my goal is to make the story easily understandable while cutting out the chaff, it's kind of hard to depict just how entirely this character takes over this plot. This is because, although most of their scenes are perfunctory and cuttable, their presence in this game's story scenes, dialogue, battle preparation conversations, and completely new chapters and missions is nothing less than overwhelming. Though I choose to shorten this game's title to New Mystery of the Emblem for brevity's sake in this video, Fire Emblem 12 is definitely more dedicated to the Heroes of Light and Shadow part of its name rather than the Mystery of the Emblem part. While Marth is the Hero of the Light who was remembered throughout time, he actually shares half the limelight with the Hero from the Shadows, the one that was supposedly forgotten about, aka retconned, Chris. I find whenever I write my story synopses, simply going through the process of writing down what happened tends to sort out what is actually important and what is completely disposable just on its own. 
When retelling the plot of New Mystery of the Emblem, it was tempting to simply leave out Chris entirely, because everything to do with him, the training of the Seventh Squad, and the events with Katarina and the League of Assassins is entirely filler. This isn't a bad thing. The questionable part of all this only comes in when the game overtly starts overshadowing the original plot to bump up this filler's importance. In no uncertain terms, Marth is no longer the main character of this game anymore. Though Marth does still have to stick the dragon in the end, had this been another genre, then Chris would have been the main character and Marth our AI-controlled sidekick. We start the game with the creation of Chris, and then take them through the quite hefty prologue section as they form their own circle of friends, rapidly become the most important knight in Altea, and then go on to form relationships with every single character in the entire game. Now, I don't actually have an issue with this structure in theory. It actually sounds pretty cool to imagine a Fire Emblem game where we are not playing from the perspective of the main lord, but just in the role of one of his knights. It's kind of like how we played as Raiden in Metal Gear Solid 2, for the purposes of making the longtime series protagonist Solid Snake look like the super soldier legend that the games built him up to be. This is more of an issue in the context of this game specifically, because not only does Chris have a lot of exposure here, but every bit of it that he was given in the main plot was done by writing all over someone else's development. Most of the time in Fire Emblem 12, this is done by making Jagan an irrelevant character as every great scene of his and the original mystery that showed off how loyal and intimidating the old knight could still be, we now have Chris sticking his head in the middle of things to lap up an undeserved level of attention. By the way, I was not joking when I said that literally the entire cast forms relationships with Chris, and this is easily seen with the return of the leveling support system. At first glance, New Mystery seems to be returning back to the info and support conversation systems of Path of Radiance, which is quite the worthy goal. Fire Emblem 9 definitely had the best support system in any of these games so far. The critical difference between FE9 and FE12 is that this system is less of an army support system and more of a Chris support system. Out of a cast of over 70 characters, over half have conversations with nobody else but Chris. Now, even though this imbalance annoys me, I can't really say that I truly hate it, because at the very least, we do get to see every character's personality to a degree. And I admit that it was fun to see how this game handled the previously extremely underwritten 16-bit era cast. Still, this is obviously lopsided. Many people argue that this imbalance is just due to the developers trying to puff up the player's egos. After all, the avatar is supposed to be you, and you are meant to feel awesome. If this is the trope that they were trying to go with, then it actually wasn't done very well here. Unlike the other overly beloved heroes from other games that are meant to fulfill this role, for instance Link from the Legend of Zelda games, Chris, by comparison, is a fully written character with their own predetermined personality and responses. He or she has a backstory, albeit one that is marginally affected by the player's responses during character creation. But with this aside, Chris has their own reaction and place in the plot, and completely predetermined aspirations and goals. Chris isn't you or me, they're just a unit that we can play dress up with. All this attention on them is inappropriately placed. Even if I did get a kick out of many of the underwritten cast conversations with them, as I discussed in my Radiant Dawn video, I have over time gained higher and higher expectations for the ensemble writing of this series now putting this much focus on a single part of this overall cast, even if it was done on the traditional main character Lord, is still a mockery of the exciting and varied pairings that fleshed out the Fire Emblem casts of old. At this point, I've played many Fire Emblems with support systems and many without it, and I've seen them both work within their chosen goals. If you're going to cut this system, then cut it. Shadow Dragon did, and it didn't actually bother me that much. On the other hand, if you're choosing to include a support system for the cast, then include a support system for the cast. Even with some of the greatest characters thus far in Fire Emblem, if they were focused on as overtly as Chris was here, I'd be raising a red flag all the same. I feel as if the story writing for New Mystery was giving me what I wanted, but through gritted teeth the whole time. It is half of what I love about the games and characters of old, while the other half was devotedly determined to keep photobombing the moment. It's not bad, it's just frustrating. 
there's definitely a difference. There might be no other better example of this than the absurd obsession that this game has with giving Chris new hats or hairstyles every couple of missions. There is no moment too serious or too solemn to not bring this up. It doesn't matter if people are dying and the world is at stake, this game will keep giving you funny hats. I don't even know what the hell I'm supposed to say about this, it's just bafflingly in the game all over the place. Underneath decisions like this, the enjoyable tale of the War of Heroes is still present, even if its integrity has been perverted. To be honest, playing this game after knowing the original is kind of like watching the special editions of the original Star Wars movies. You can be totally into what's going on, but you just can't get sucked in because every couple of scenes, you have to put up with some new tacked-on bullshit. If there's one thing I've learned through making this series, it's that, no matter how similar two Fire Emblem games look, and the two DS Fire Emblems look almost identical, in themes and practice they can still be worlds apart. While that was definitely the case with the story here, next up we're going to see if that also holds true with the gameplay. Fire Emblem 12 is definitely a game that wears a lot of hats. All at once, it is dedicated to remaking and remixing the content of Fire Emblem 3 Book 2, implementing huge balance changes that followed on from its direct predecessor, and also bringing new systems out on top of both of these at the same time. Trying to tackle these all at once would make it sound like a confusing, contradictory mess, so I'll try my best to sort these out. Let's start with updates to the original Super Famicom game. One of the new, flashy features of the original Mystery of the Emblem was the newly added ability for mounted characters to dismount, a feature that was further enforced through Mystery of the Emblem's level design. This function was only seen in one more game, Thracia 776, before disappearing from the series entirely. And to be honest, I can't say that I've really missed it. With the idea of dismounting being dead and buried by the time of Fire Emblem 12, there were some necessary changes that had to happen to its level design, most noticeable right away in Chapter 1, where the previous valley that was only passable on foot has now been clearly widened. There are other examples of this throughout the game, but in general I think they all work really well. I definitely always thought that the starting maps of the War of Heroes had some tedious level design, and this was a very strange place to start out. Besides this, there have also been a variety of smaller changes to items and systems. For example, we have the Star Shards that you collect throughout the early and mid-game, which used to improve unit growth rates, working much like Thracia 776's Crusader Scrolls, which I discussed in detail in that video. In New Mystery of the Emblem, these items simply buff certain stats for as long as they're held by that unit. This is sort of an equivalent change, although it does mean that they are less abusable for grinding out perfect stats. That's not saying that the game doesn't have an issue with that in other ways, but I'll be talking about that in the next part. While there have been other small changes, in general, Fire Emblem 12 did do a good job at making some necessary quality of life enhancements to the original game's design. I already talked about how smoothly and quickly Shadow Dragon played in the last video, and of course the improvements to the speed of play is virtually unchanged here. The DS emblems are fast-paced and a lot of fun, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't built on some pretty funky balancing. Of course, the issue in Shadow Dragon was you being able to forge unbelievably useful weapons, which preyed upon the game's lack of enemy and boss variety. Fortunately, New Mystery doesn't really suffer from that same issue as much. For one, enemy and boss variety is far better, which definitely addressed the godlike usability of Sita's wing spear and other effective weapons. On top of this, the Ballistician units, Jake and Beck, who were also able to benefit from forging, in this game have both just happened to misplace their ballistas between now and then. As a result, there is really no outright broken mechanic that sticks out as hard in this game. But there is something to be said about how class change can now lead players to an easy path to victory. The whole system of class change was a brand new feature introduced in the previous game, and to be honest, I thought I would have a lot to say about it, but when I started writing the script, I just couldn't think of anything interesting to add. It sort of just does what it says on the tin. Almost all units are able to change classes, with quantity limits set on each type of unit, so you can't just roll up with a party of 12 wyvern riders and end missions in three turns. It's an interesting option that gives you the ability to choose the classes that you want, or it can also serve as a failsafe if you happen to lose a key ally like a healer or magic user. 
While the six flyers that the system limited you to on the last game's maps was reasonable, Mystery of the Emblem's maps, by comparison, tended to have a lot more quirky personality. They often implemented tricks and traps that were designed about you being landlocked early on, and not having a sudden fleet of units who could sail right over its intricately crafted level design. Take, for instance, the Wyvern Trap in Chapter 3. In the middle of the map, there are extremely powerful Wyvern Riders who appear to be neutral to your actions. They will only aggro you if you visit the armory nearby the castle due to the owners of the shop being in league with the Macedon rebels, which is something that one of the people in the houses will warn you about if you visit them. Although you gain Paula on this map, and she is very much a powerful unit at this point in time, even she can still struggle with these units, especially since they all dive you at once. I definitely remember only barely squeaking by their encounter in the original game. In New Mystery of the Emblem, I was able to simply reclass the promoted Aaron into a Wyvern Rider. As the Jagan of this game, early on he is absolutely in his element, and of course he totally destroyed these guys. I admit it felt good that I was finally able to get my revenge after all this time, but as more and more of these instances of spoiling the point cropped up, I couldn't help but feel just a little bit let down. As you get more and more pre-promotes who you can immediately class change to flyers, this issue crops up more and more in the later game maps as well. Though I may have been complaining a bit about how this thing let me down, I have to say that I don't think that breaking the map design intentions is a wholly bad thing. After all, I only realized how I could trivialize a lot of these maps due to my time investment and knowledge of this series' systems. Unless a player is already experienced with these games, this path to power is not completely evident, and I do think it is okay to include faster paths for those savvy enough to find them. A great example of this in another game happens in the first real boss of Demon Souls. The boss Phalanx is weak to fire, and you find plenty of firebombs in the level leading up to them. A novice player who is struggling just with the challenge of the level getting up to him will see these firebombs as meant to help them with the regular enemies, which could lead to a later event where they struggle heavily against the boss. Likewise, an experienced or researched player would know to keep these firebombs for the upcoming fight, and once getting there, they would be rewarded by being able to trivialize it. In this situation, the player's knowledge of the game was just as much a weapon as the actual item. I really do love games that have this kind of depth, where long after you've turned off your console and set down your controller, they still stick in your head, and you find yourself considering more and more possible ways of claiming mastery over them. This sort of feeling, which I hope many other gamers will recognize, was actually the inspiration for this channel's original name, GamesBrain. While Class Change is an example of a system which is rewarding to learn and implement, the thrill of executing on your own proper plans would have been completely lost if the game simply offered to automatically change all your units into classes that best fit the scenarios at hand. Doing so would kind of ruin the process of learning the game and mindfully adapting your own strategies. Instead, you'd simply be taking the helping hand that was given to you and missing out on a lot of the experience. Of course, all players would have the option of refusing it, and to keep refusing it every time it was given, but if there was nothing to lose from taking this help and the game offered it in its own context as just another system, then it's easy to see how many players would take it, thinking that this was how the game was meant to be played, and unfortunately as a result, they would lose out on the enjoyable aspect of learning mastery for themselves. Of course, the scenario that I'm laying out here isn't what actually happened, and I don't think that intelligent systems would ever take such an action. All I was just trying to do by giving that hypothetical example was to start to paint a clearer picture in your mind why the drill grounds of this game are a terrible addition to the series. Back in my Fire Emblem 8 The Sacred Stones video, I laid out my initial take on the free experience grinding system of that game, and how I thought I couldn't see myself having an issue with it, as long as grinding systems continued to be an optional feature. As much as this retrospective series is meant to solidify my opinions on each game, I make these videos between my experiences with each one, and also before I have played through the entire series. In short, they are retrospectives and also reviews, but what you're basically watching is each step of my documented learning process. 
What this means is from time to time, simply through having more exposure to the series, or just more time for certain ideas to ruminate in my mind, sometimes my previous opinions are going to change. This has already happened subtly one time before, as over time I eventually realized the true power of cavalry units, even without Kanto. The next one has already happened, it's just that Fire Emblem 12 gives me a good time to explain how my opinion on optional grinding systems, and especially Fire Emblem 12's Drill Grounds, has changed quite a bit. Let's back up for a minute here though. The Drill Grounds of Fire Emblem 12 is basically just another arena, and in combat it works similarly to how it has always been done, going back as far as the very first game. There's a pretty big difference here though. In New Mystery of the Emblem, you use the arena between maps, and quite critically, you are able to see the battle readouts ahead of time. Previous arena systems were balanced out by being a big risk, and not knowing exactly what you'd be going up against. If you couldn't exit your fighter out quickly enough, they would be gone for good. In this version, where you can see exactly what you're going up against, as well as save in between every bout if you wish, it's not really risky anymore. This is just math. The one saving grace of the Drill Grounds is the fact that using it does not return your money back to you, and each time you fight you will be using up your weapon durability. This would be a decent limiter, except that using it is comically cheap. It is by far the safest and simplest method of grinding ever seen in the series before. Sure, Fire Emblem 8 actually pays you for grinding, but the Tower of Valny can be a dangerous place for low-level units, and grinding through it takes much more time. The Drill Grounds can get any character from newbie to veteran in a matter of 10 minutes tops maybe, all for a few thousand gold. So, what is the problem exactly? I have the option to ignore this system if I want to. That is true, but that doesn't mean that we don't have a problem here. The issue is, and always has been, how these simple grinding systems imbalance the limited resource system that Fire Emblem is built around. It's pretty universally agreed on that units like Seth, Titania, and Sita with her wing spear are way too strong, and can end up invalidating a lot of other units. Free grinding is this same problem, but from a resource system's perspective. Allow me to illustrate this from a completely different viewpoint. Imagine that there was an action game that, during the course of your first playthrough, allowed you to purchase cheats that could let you turn on something like invincibility for your character, or permanent invisibility, or infinite ammo. All of these with absolutely no drawbacks. If this was done using the same currency as the rest of the game, then every player would have a bizarre dilemma to deal with. It feels obvious to say that these kind of power boosting options are better reserved for new game plus modes, simply because their mere presence as equally available options throws a heavy shadow over any other potential purchases. This is exactly the issue that free or painless grinding systems inflict upon this series. Why bother forging weapons? weapons after all, when with far less money you can just train up the same unit that you might have given that weapon to. If I suddenly jump my Est 20 levels as soon as I get her, for half the price of any decent forge weapon, every iron lance that I put in her hand is going to kill everything anyways. A new weapon would only benefit her attack. Using the cheaper training grounds also gives her more health, defense, speed, and just about everything else. To clarify, I have no problem with grinding being in Fire Emblem games, but it is entirely a matter of implementation. I am aware that grinding systems are going to stay with this series from this point on, and with that being the case, I think it's good to establish a baseline going forward of what good and bad versions of that will be. So far from what I've seen, and what I think I will see in the future, I feel pretty safe in saying that the Drill Grounds are probably the worst implementation of this in the whole series. Well, exploring the depths of New Mystery of the Emblem has certainly been a more difficult journey than I could have ever imagined. Having now covered everything that I wanted to cover with it, it's time to finally take a step back and see how everything in this very unique entry adds up. I remember feeling worried in the past that, when I got to the DS Fire Emblems, I wouldn't have much to say about them. 
After all, they're just remakes, right? Having climbed this far into the series, and now experienced this era's stories and gameplay styles, I can now say with total certainty that no, these games are not just simple remakes. They are actually two of the most fascinating entries in this entire series, for very different reasons. Between the two, however, New Mystery of the Emblem is definitely the most outlandish, bordering on bizarre. While it continued the quality of life improvements that its predecessor brought, as well as restoring some great ideas from previous installments that its predecessor also cut, the sum of all its parts turned out to not be as great as they could and probably should have been. For every design decision that I would love to shower with praise, there is some kind of issue with it that I would want to criticize just as hard. Unlike Shadow Dragon, which polished and honed its more limited scope, New Mystery seems to be a case of trying to expand too rapidly and at the end of the day, it makes it really hard for me to recommend it. I actually enjoyed the original version far more than this one, and the original Mystery of the Emblem isn't even one of my favorites, but at least experiencing that version allows me to cut out the bloated and ill-conceived additional functions here, and it just gives me what I enjoyed most out of it, a deeper, more difficult, and slightly excessive follow-up journey for Marth and his allies. Perhaps it's this realization that I would honestly prefer playing the now 26-year-old original over this newer version from only a single decade ago that says the most about my overall feelings on this one. It's hard to swallow the truth sometimes, especially because I really found myself wanting to love this game. I love pieces of it, and that's about all I can say in the end. Next up on the Fire Emblem Retrospective, we will at last be arriving at one of the most pivotal games in the entire series. Join me next time as we jump over to the 3DS in Fire Emblem Awakening. At last, Season 3 of this retrospective series is complete, but if you have enjoyed these videos thus far, then I could really use your support in keeping everything running here by becoming a Patreon supporter. At this point, I have dedicated over a year and a half to this project, and each of these videos takes a very long time to plan out, script, record, cut, and then edit together. And unfortunately, this kind of slower-paced, long-form content does not make for the kind of videos that YouTube likes to promote. Supporting this channel on Patreon allows me to not have to bow to the whims of the mighty algorithm, and instead spend my time making exactly the kind of videos that you like to see. If you have enjoyed this series thus far, then please consider donating just a dollar or more over on Patreon. Not only does it allow this channel and this series to continue, but doing so also allows you to get a backstage pass to myself and all of my content, such as having chats with me and others on the exclusive Shane Brain Discord channel, where I also keep my patrons up to date on my current developments on projects. On top of this, patrons also get exclusive early access to my videos, weeks to sometimes months in advance of the general public. $1 supporters are able to gain one week early access to all my videos in advance of their public releases on YouTube. $3 supporters can watch the full season of my videos as soon as they are fully complete, and $5 supporters and above get immediate access to everything I make as soon as it's done. My next major video project throughout the rest of 2020 will be going through the final chunk of the four remaining Fire Emblem games. This means I'll be covering Awakening, all versions of Fates, Echoes, Shadows of Valencia, and finally Fire Emblem Three Houses. I'm unsure yet whether I will break the Fates videos into multiple parts or not, but whatever the case, this will be Season 4 of the Fire Emblem Retrospective. This has the possibility to be the heftiest chunk of this series so far, and so I'm going to go ahead and ask that if you do enjoy these videos, please don't wait to begin your channel support, as I may be making this part of the retrospective for some time. As always, I will keep my patrons the most up to date, and continue to make YouTube posts from time to time whenever I hit the next major milestone. Well, I think that's all from me today. Thank you again so much for helping me get this far. I'll see you next time. I'd like to give a special thank you to Connie Reed, DW7 Still Rules, Henry Gutierrez, Ignis Isel, Jesus Ruiz, Radiant Archiver, Ryan Poe, and True Tactician, as well as to all of my other supporters who make these videos possible by donating on Patreon. Thank you all very much.